turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. Sing that again. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can.
destined to die poured out for all mankind God's only son perfect and spotless one he never sinned but suffered as if he
I broke it. Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to Lighthouse Church. Thanks for joining us this morning. I got like double mics. I don't know what to do with my hands now, guys. Okay. Anyway, okay. Uh, thanks for coming. We're so thankful that you're here with us this morning. Uh, grateful that we can celebrate the Lord Jesus together. Uh, and we honestly hope that, again, as you come in, you can be filled up, be able to take on whatever God has for you this week. We truly believe that uh, God wants you to live a life where you're filled by the Holy Spirit and able to, to live out of that place. And we're looking forward to hearing from Pastor Gary this morning on that. Uh, there's a lot going on in the next couple of weeks here at the Lighthouse Church, and it's all in the lobby. Like, you just go hang on in there. You'll see it all. You'll get the picture. We have boxes for Operation Christmas Child. We have our uh, women's mosaic Advent wreath, calend- Advent wreath sorry, making night. We have our Thanksgiving here at the Lighthouse Church. We have our peak survey assessment that we'd love for you to take as well if you're part of this body. It's all in the lobby, so go out there, check it out. We'd love for you uh, to get plugged in in that way. Uh, that's really all I have this morning as far as announcements go. Uh, we're going to take our offering at this time. We have a basket up here and up here and then a couple in the back. If this is one of your first times with us, we don't want your money. Just enjoy this service. Let it be a, a gift to you. And uh, again, then if you have kids after this next song, you can send them on out. Now let me pray this morning as we continue. Father God, thank you so much that uh, we stand here this morning, God, whether we feel it or not, in victory, Lord. In victory because of what you've done for us, Jesus. In victory because it's what you have done to go before us, God, the work that you've done to get us, to invite us back into your family, Lord. It's incredible. And so, God, this morning, uh, I know there are people that hopefully came in well-rested. If they have little kids, probably not. It's okay. Either way, Lord, we recognize that in you we find that shalom, that rest that we're looking for. Father God, would you encourage us this morning? Lord, I'm thinking of those in this body that that need a physical healing touch, Lord. Would you heal them this morning in the name of Jesus? God, those families that are walking through hard times, Lord, wounds that we have from past relationships, God, all these things that we carry, Lord, we lay down at your feet this morning to pick up your hope, to pick up your grace, Lord, to find the the fullness and the wholeness that we're looking for is in Jesus Christ. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would break addictions in this place this morning. Father God, that in all things that you would receive glory and honor. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. stirs in my soul, draws me near, calls me close, deeper into this love that won't run out, won't dry up, oh let it
So if you have a Bible, if you would turn to Genesis. Uh, Genesis 1, we're going to be in Genesis, Ezekiel, uh, Acts, and Ephesians. Lord, Lord, we're people who usually um, hide from the rain or cover up. And Lord, we just sang a song about your spirit raining down. Lord, I pray that uh, we would be people who understand the words that we sing and are receptive to your spirit, your Holy Spirit that is without limit. I thank you today that your voice is powerful and majestic, that, Lord, the qualities of your character and who you are are visible from any place we are if we're breathing today. I thank you uh, that you are not silent I thank you for your creation that pours forth speech that is the outer fringes of who you are. I thank you for your word. I thank you for living in a country of freedom today where we can carry it around without fear of persecution, where we can meet together on a morning or a night or whenever we want and open it without fear of persecution. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Without your Holy Spirit, we have an inability to even understand what's in your word. It's your Holy Spirit that calls us, that seals us, that empowers us. Lord, the same power that conquered the grave lives in us. Lord, and we thank you for Jesus. It wouldn't be possible without Jesus. Under no other name is salvation found. Every every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I pray if there's anybody with an earshot today that doesn't know you, that needs to come to you or return to you, that you would call and we'd repent, that you would enable us to come to you in the name of Jesus for salvation. I pray for those of us that believe for salvation, that salvation, healing, victory, joy, peace, strength, power, would move through our body, not because of what we're doing, but because of what you want to do, through your Holy Spirit, as your word goes forth, that you be glorified. In Jesus' name. Last week was a little bit of a reflective week um, for Debbie and I. As we, in August, it was our fourth year that we moved down here, but it was the first week in November, three years ago, that we finalized our, uh, the sale of our house up north, and we closed on a house down here. And so leaving one home that you lived in for 18 years and moving into a new home uh, finalizes a little bit uh, for our family. A family, uh, when we moved down here, uh, Debbie and I, uh, who grew up in Morris County, uh, lived in the same house for 18 years. Uh, had a, had a, when we moved down, Greg was in the eighth grade, Emily was a junior, and as you know, that is a significant sort of shift in our life. We also left our jobs. Uh, I was working for an organization called Youth Advocate Programs. It's an international nonprofit organization to work with at-risk youth and their families to keep them out of incarceration. And I remember I was there for eight years, had an amazing experience there, learned a ton, God bless the work of my hands, had an amazing supervisor. He was the regional uh, director in the areas uh, that I was serving. And uh, after accepting a position to be one of the pastors here at the Lighthouse Church, I had to reveal to him that I was going to resign uh, from my position after eight years of working there. And after accepting the position here, uh, my boss was on vacation. And so I had to wait two weeks uh, with this information and not tell anybody uh, that I was working with. I worked with a lot of people uh, in the day-to-day, and that was hard to sit on. And uh, when I told him, uh, he came back from vacation, I told him, and uh, he's a Muslim, and I tell you that because of the question he's about to ask me. Uh, I, I told him that I was going to be leaving uh, youth advocate programs. And of course, his question that followed, well, what are you, where are you going? Like, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going down to South Jersey. He actually lives in Atlanta County. I said, I'm going down to South Jersey to be a pastor in a church called the Lighthouse Church. And he said, pastor? He said, is that even really a job? And uh, I think that's a fair question. It's a question I ask myself uh, quite a bit. Uh, Is being a pastor really a job? We know that it's one of the gifts. 
We know that the Bible talks about pastor. It's very uh, closely related to that of elder, pastor elder. We know that it's defined as a shepherd. And we know that the Bible, there's qualifications to what a pastor and elder should be. But there's really no job description in the Bible about what it is a pastor is supposed to do. And people have asked me along the way, and it's a legitimate question. I kind of get what you people do on the weekends, but what do you really do in the day-to-day? -day? Like during the week, what do you do? And I ask myself the same question. What is it that I'm supposed to do, and am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Am I doing what society wants me to do, or am I really doing what God wants me to do in the day-to-day? -day? How do we know what a pastor, the call of pastor, actually looks like? Over the past 30 years that I've been in and out of ministry, it is not a secret. And this statement doesn't mean that God is not moving and working in America. But if you looked at the studies over the past 30 years, the American Christian church is on a rapid decline. We also know, if you looked at the statistics, that prior to the pandemic, the amount of pastors that were leaving ministry, extraordinary either from burnout, on their own, or being asked to leave. Bring the pandemic in, where some churches were decimated. And then pastors who decided to leave, because what I've read for some churches, while they may have remained intact, are dealing with a great amount of division because of all that came with the pandemic. I think about young couples who have kids and young couples who are about to have kids and working with kids and families for 25 years. And when kids are born and you see in some families a new dynamic develop that's causing division, kids don't create or cause conflict. They reveal issues that were already there. And in some of our churches, the division that we see rising up was already there. It's just that this is revealed a greater level. It's bringing it to the forefront. And so when you think about all that is, the state of the American church, the amount of pastors leaving ministry, the division, and what is the call of a pastor in and of itself, it can create a little bit of confusion. And I believe that part of the state that we're in in America is because we put more emphasis on the man called pastor than we do the Holy Spirit. And we're looking for a man to drive a church when there is no man that has an ability to drive a church. It is the role of the Holy Spirit to drive the church of Christ. That can't happen if the Holy Spirit isn't driving us. Because we are the church. And so over the next two weeks, you could talk about the Holy Spirit for the next six months. But over the next two weeks, we're going to look at the core value of being empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're not just talking about having the Holy Spirit with you. We're talking about having the Holy Spirit drive you. When we've been talking about the core values, and empowered by the Holy Spirit is the last of the core values. Because when you think about the Bible being indispensable in the work of Christ, when you think about prayer being the primary work of the church, when you think about lost people matter to God, being a church and people that take faith-filled risks, that it's all God's, that we're supposed to be mobilizing devoted disciples. None of that happens without being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to begin today by looking in Genesis, Ezekiel, Acts, and Ephesians in a very few minutes. And we begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 
Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Can you imagine how cool that must have been to be there? As the Spirit of God in the midst of his creation was hovering over the waters. The word here for Spirit of God is a word, Hebrew word, called ruah. That word is mentioned 400-ish times in the Bible. We translate it and put typically three words on the word ruah. Breath, wind, and spirit. If you were to dissect this word, and I am not an expert in Hebrew. I did take Greek, not Hebrew. But for those who are experts in this sort of language, if you were to dissect that word, it has two root meanings. The first one, wind, and the second one is a prescribed path. So when you put the parts of this word in Hebrew together, the Spirit of God is described as the wind that follows the prescribed path. The Spirit of the living God, the wind that follows the prescribed path. And so what I want to do in places of Scripture today is look at how the Spirit of God moves in and through us. And I want to go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel was a man, flesh and blood like you and I, who was called by God to be his spokesman. The word Ezekiel means strengthened by God. Ezekiel was a prophet. God sent prophets, his chosen people, to warn his people. We know, long story short, that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. They, got, they cried out to God. God heard their cry. God sent Moses and Aaron that God would free them by God's power and bring them into the promised land that they would live, yes, in freedom, but they would live in relationship. He was going to be their God, and they would be his people, that they would live in relationship, that they would experience his glory and his presence and his power. But we know along the way that these Israelites were stubborn, stiff-necked, rebellious, prostituted himself, themselves, much like we do. And God, as an act of love, sent prophets to warn them and say, listen, if you don't repent... Judgment is coming. You see, God is a God of justice. And he said, if you don't repent, there's ju if you do repent, you're going to be fine. But if you don't, judgments. They didn't repent. God allowed the Babylonians through Nebuchadnezzar to come and wreak havoc on his own people. The Babylonians destroyed many of those people. And the people they didn't destroy, they took the captivity back to Babylon in waves. It is said that Ezekiel, who was a priest in Jerusalem, was taken captive during the second wave of people that were brought back to Babylon. And Ezekiel, I think it's two or three, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, God said to Ezekiel, during this time, I'm labeling you or considering you a watchman. Meaning, I'm going to give you something to say, and you better say it. It doesn't matter if people listen or don't listen. You say it. If you don't say it and somebody dies in their sin, the blood's on you. If you do say it and they repent, good. If they don't repent, the blood's on them. And at Ezekiel chapter 27, as Ezekiel is following the path of God, God says to Ezekiel, I'm going to send a message to my people, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take your wife off the earth. I'm going to take the delight of your eyes to send my people a message, and I don't want you to mourn. And he does exactly what God asked him to do. These people are living in captivity. They're a bro Can you imagine? Can you imagine another state even coming and destroying this area? People you know, relatives you know, your homes are gone, and you're taken into captivity. And not just that, the glory of the Lord has left them. His presence and his power. But in Ezekiel chapter 37, God says, even in the midst of your misery and the captivity, I've got a message of hope for you. And this is the message of hope. I 
Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied and I was, as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that, that I, the Lord, have spoken and that I have done it, declares the Lord. Incredible vision. Can you imagine being Ezekiel and seeing this bone scattered? And how amazing is it? That God reassembled these bones. But even better than that, he gave life to the dead. When we, prior to moving down here, and we moved into our house 18 years ago, it was prior to us having kids. And we lived in a development that had hundreds of houses. It was huge. And uh, you, were, you were relatively close to your neighbors, and we were very fortunate over the 18 years, to have great neighbors. And the people that lived next to us for the 18 years, uh, right, immediately to the right of us, uh, was a great family. Uh, they're about 15 to 20 years older than us, husband and wife. They had a son and a daughter, and the daughter uh, was born with Rett syndrome. She was confined to a wheelchair, and she could never speak, um, and so they cared for her along the way. And they had a son. And in 2011, uh, their son was 27 years old when he got into a bike accident. The bike accident, uh, a accident uh, caused a head trauma that landed him uh, in the emergency room that landed him in the intensive care unit. And he was there for days and then what appeared to be a couple weeks. And along the way, as they were going through this process of caring uh, for their son, hoping that he would recover uh, from this head uh, trauma, uh, I remember going to the hospital and praying over him and, and praying for his mother and praying for the family. But this sort of um, time seemed to linger. Like they were spending a lot of time at the hospital, the husband and wife, uh, with their son that was in ICU. And so uh, the week uh, before Thanksgiving, it was either Monday or Tuesday, I remember sitting in traffic on Route 80. And I was sitting in traffic, and I called Debbie, and I said, Debbie, why don't, can you, and our kids were little at this point, and I said, do you think you could find someone to watch the kids? Why don't we go Wednesday, uh, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and let's take them out to dinner? Like, let's go, like, they were there a lot. Uh, I can't imagine what it must be like uh, to be in a, in a position like that. And so I said, let's go take them out to dinner. So she got somebody to watch the kids, and Debbie and I drove to the hospital with the intention of taking them out to dinner to try to be a source of encouragement to them. And we got into the hospital at night, and we went into the ICU, and as soon as I walked into the ICU, I made contact with the, the, the boy's uh, father, and he stared right at me from across the ICU, and he said, he's coding. 
And so over the next few hours, Debbie and I, you want to talk about a divine appointment, walked alongside this family as their son died. I don't know if you've ever been with another human being who took their last breath. It is beyond profound. But not only that, being in this setting, and I don't remember the exact time we were there, it was a couple hours, to watch a group of people try to save this young man's life. And I remember periods of time where he would flatline, and then the doctors would come in, and I'm telling you, it was they would rip the machines off him, and I literally saw a doctor get on his bed and was literally pounding on his chest to try to bring him back to life to no avail. And I feel like at times that's a picture of us trying to take life out of things that are lifeless. That this world is filled with stuff around us that are called lifeless idols. But you and I walk around this earth at times and try to take life out of them to fill the void that is only there for God. It's called the incurable wound. We were born separated for God, and we were built and created for God. And so being separated from him, we try to grab these things that we think have life, even though there's no life, and try to jam them into our being. And we've heard story after story after story about people who go down that road and leads to a further road of destruction. When God says, I have created you for life, abundant life, that only comes through Jesus. I get why unbelievers do that. What I don't get is why believers continue to do it. Is while those of us who have a relationship with God through Jesus continue to go to things of this world, relationships, money, identity, to fill the void, when it's only God who gives life and gives it to the fill. That life begins the life that the Holy Spirit has to revive you and I as walking dead men only comes with salvation. If you go to Acts chapter 9, there's another man that lived this earth, and his name was Saul. Saul was born into the Jewish faith, and he was passionate about the Jewish faith. So much so that when the followers of the way, that was followers of Jesus. They called it the way. Saul made it his sort of mission to destroy followers of the way because he was concerned that Jesus and Jesus' people were going to contaminate the Jewish faith. And so Saul said, I'm going after those people in an effort to preserve the Jewish faith. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who, were, who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard a sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So he, they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there is a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, 
This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. How amazing that a man completely opposed in a completely different, different direction, God met and did a complete 180 because of the Holy Spirit who gave him what? Eyes to see. The Holy Spirit gives us life and unblinds us and gives us the ability to see what we couldn't see before. I remember years ago when Emily was 16 years old, and um, during that age of, of a young uh, teenage six, there's a lot of uh, sweet 16 parties. And so she had a friend who uh, wasn't going to do a sweet 16 party. Uh, this girl's friend was going to take uh, her and a couple friends, or a friend, to Florida, to Disney World, for some, uh, for, to celebrate his 16th birthday. And so Emily was one of the friends that was invited to go to Disney World for this girl's 16th birthday. And it happened over Christmas vacation when we were going to be in Florida anyway, visiting Debbie's family. And so we're in Florida visiting Debbie's family, and uh, partly through that vacation, we drove to Disney World uh, to drop Emily off uh, with her friend and her mom uh, at this resort in Disney World. And so we get into this resort, and it's packed, right, with people. It's I could sit in the lobby of one of these places all day and watch the organized chaos that's going on as, as these families are checking in, right, for this vacation. But as I'm sitting in the lobby, something stood out to me. I'm not, in the middle of the lobby was a young woman, I don't know, between the ages of maybe 18 and 20-ish, completely blind. And so internally I thought, what is she doing here? Like, how is she going to experience all that's Disney? when she has an inability to see. And I wonder how many times God views us the same way. That he has given us life. And he has given us an ability to see where life comes from. And we are surrounded by all that is of the kingdom of God. And yet we still live in the world. We still grab things of the world. and want, but You can't have both. It's either God or the world. You see, he gives us the ability, the Holy Spirit, to see where the direction comes from. And it's the spirit of the living God. If you jump back over, real quick, to Ezekiel chapter 36, where he's talking about restoring the kingdom, Israel. And he's also talking about the new covenant. 36, verse 26, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful and be careful to keep my laws. His spirit is the one that moves us. It's not simply his spirit with us to make our life better. It's his spirit that shifts our direction. He is the one that will decide your direction and the pace of your movement. It is him alone. Are you willing to give him complete authority so that you can experience his power and his presence like these people did? And some may say, I don't understand because I know I've said that prayer. I know I go to church, but I'm not experiencing his presence and his power. If we, uh, you quickly jump over to Ephesians chapter 4. And it might be because we're living more in the flesh 
as opposed to the Spirit. In Ephesians 4, verse 29, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. I love how grieving the Holy Spirit is sandwiched right in the middle of all that. Because I wonder if the church is on the decline because we've lost the presence and power of God. Because we try to put into church human means to bring out the life of God. You want to see the life of God? Do we want to see the Spirit of God? How about love Him and love others? He says, could it be any clearer? Could this be any clearer? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Only, I'm guilty. What is helpful to building others up according to their needs that it may benefit them. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every kind of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Everyone. Forgive Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I've heard people say, I can't forgive. God's forgiven you. He doesn't even know your sin. As far as the east is from the west. I've heard people say, I can forgive, but I'm not going to forget. What? God has chosen to not look at you. He sees you as holy. Your sin is behind you. And that we put ourselves in a position higher than God and says, I'm not going to forgive. I get outside, I don't get inside. Who are we? It's pride. It's selfish. It's childish. And I'm guilty. I don't say it in judgment. I say it as a fellow co-struggler. That's living in the flesh. The staff and the elders read a book called the five dysfunctions of a team. Doesn't imply we have lots of dysfunction. What it talks about is the opposite of that. And the qualities of a team that allows conflict, that's involved in commitment, walking down the same road even though you don't all agree. It involves accountability. And one of the things this book talks about is, is people and teams have an ability to live in artificial harmony. I believe the church has mastered that. That we as Christians come together with smiles on and everything's fine when everything's not fine. Living in flesh, we live with artificial harmony. The Bible calls us to live in the spirit that leads us to unity. You and I have an inability to do that on our own. I'm not asking you to do better. I'm asking you to lean in to God who provided his Holy Spirit to inhabit your being and change you and I from the inside out. I close with a young man I worked with when I was with the Youth Advocate Program. It's the second year in. I had a friend call me and said, I got a guy I want you to interview. I think he might be a good fit for your organization. He was a former gang member that served five years in jail for conspiracy to murder. This gang that he was involved in had an unsanctioned drive-by shooting. And because it was unsanctioned, the gang killed two of their own. And he had a role in this. So he served five years in jails, dropped his colors in prison, became a believer. Years had moved. And I interviewed him and I hired him. He was with me for six years. He's a friend of mine today, an amazing man that God has changed from the inside out. He won't even tell you that he's involved in a gang. He wouldn't even tell the kids that we worked with. I had to sort of force it out of him. Like, you need to tell your story. Because he, he felt the weight of what he was involved in in the past. And I remember one time he was telling his story and some of the kids he was interacting with said, tell us, he was a high-ranking member in this gang. And the kids said, what are, where are some of the other people that you used to sort of run with? And he talked about one of the key people in this gang. And he said, he's down the streets today. 
He said, but he's a shell of a man. He said he used to walk with authority and purpose, but now it's gone. My encouragement to you is not to walk around as a shell of a believer. Where we have the, we've put on the outer layers of a believer, but allow the spirit of the God, spirit of the living God, to give you life. That life provides healing. That life provides victory, no matter where you've been, where you are, or where you think you might be going. And so my encouragement to you today is to say yes. If you've never entered a relationship with the living God, and you're still looking for this life, just say yes. Just say yes that you understand that you know you were created in his image. That you know you were created in separation from him. That a huge chasm exists. A chasm that is not crossable by human means. That it's only the life, death, and blood of Jesus Christ who's overcome not just the penalty of sin to give you a ticket, but the power of sin that we don't have to sin anymore. And yes, that I understand on some level that it's simply if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Say yes, it's between you and God. And if you said yes, tell somebody. Go to someone to pray with, because we want to give you a Bible, and we want to walk together. And for those of us that believe, say yes today to him, to his spirit, to the call, to lean in to his spirit, who wants to put himself on display, to change you, to heal you, and to love you, that he be glorified. Lord, I pray that your word would go forth. I pray for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I, I, I'm guilty, guilty and guilty of putting my position of a higher authority than you, of quenching the Holy Spirit, of looking, of saying, of thinking things that aren't from you, of taking steps that aren't ordained by you. But I thank you for your grace and your mercy as an individual, as individuals in your church, your grace and your mercy is still evident everywhere and that you still want to do a good work in and through. And it doesn't mean that you're not doing a good work, or you haven't done a good work, but help us to continue to position ourselves in a way to watch you move through you and not our work, that you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together here so we could hear your word, hear your message. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill us, to aid us in our walk as we leave this building. Help us to open up our hearts and our minds to proclaim your glory. In your son Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Folks, there's a, if you're in need of prayer, we have prayer warriors over here. Anything that's on your mind, just turn to the Lord. And there's people over here that can help you with that. They're here for your assistance, just like the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Have a great day.